Salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland, and uh, this video is going to be debate. Um, this house believes that global warming is the greatest threat. Uh, so, I shall commence in the customary fashion. Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the house, this house believes that global warming is the greatest threat. Well, first of all, what is global warming? And that is the planet warming up, uh, leading to uh, polar ice caps melting and so on. And this warming up is not just for one year, it's a long-term trend, which will last decades, possibly centuries. And it's principally anthropogenic. Yes, I know, there have been ice ages before, there have been eras where the world was warmer before, but there has never been a climate change which has been so rapid, so dramatic, as has been taking place from the mid-20th century until now. And so it's principally caused by human activity. Um, by burning uh, uh, fossil fuels, releasing more CO2 into the atmosphere, leading to um, the greenhouse effect with greenhouse gases. Now, there are a number of different things that overlap here, um, and the CFCs were released a lot as well, making a hole in the ozone layer. We've, we've reduced CFC usage considerably. It used to be in aerosols a lot, you know, spray on deodorants. So the melting of the polar ice caps would really lead to rising sea levels, and, sea le and so like countries such as the Maldives would all end up underwater. We have more extreme weather events, more hurricanes, more cyclones, and so on, more droughts. Um, the desert would advance to be less fertile land. We'd be fighting over that. Um, there'd be more salt water, less fresh water. So we'd be fighting over drinking water. Even you may have heard of that that book, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. There almost no, there's almost no snow left on Kilimanjaro. You could look at photos of glaciers from this year and look at them 20 years ago, and uh, the shrinkage of the glacier is extraordinary. So uh, you should see the Al, Al Gore's film about it, an inconvenient truth. I don't want it to be true, but it is true. And we have to face up to this. We have to examine the objective evidence. It's absolutely overwhelming. The evidence has proved irrefragably that climate change is not only happening, making the, the world warmer on the whole, occasionally making it just much colder, but much more unstable, moving between two extremes rather more. But the overall effect is, is making it hotter. Um, and that it might be natural to some extent, it happens anyway, but it's, the situation is greatly aggravated by human activity. But what we're doing, um, burning hydrocarbons, coal, natural gas, oil, and so on. Um, so I recognise there are other problems in the world. Diseases kill some people. We're all going to die anyway. Wars kill people. We spend a lot of money on that. Um, but uh, we, can, um, we can avoid fighting. That's a, that's a choice we make. We can cure some diseases. We could live healthier lifestyles. We can't live forever. Um, you know, we have nuclear missiles and mutually assured destruction. That's also a problem. We're not suggesting that climate change is the only problem, but we're saying that this is the greatest threat to humanity. We can have gas masks against some weapons of mass destruction. We can have some missiles to shoot down nuclear missiles, things like that. Perhaps the mutually assured destruction actually means that nuclear weapons aren't used. We have terrorists killing people, but really, in the grand scheme of things, with 7 billion people on the planet, is very, very few. Yes, I prefer it was zero, but let's not exaggerate the scale of the danger of that versus this, which is the possibility to wipe out human life. So we, to get, to, we can reach the stage where there's no arable land left. Most of the world is underwater. Our major conurbations are usually close to the sea. Uh, and on and on, we have more people dying in cyclones and hurricanes, and we have almost no fresh water left. So it would require an enormous amount of political will to do this. The politicians have got to have the courage to say, we're going to have to live wet less well. We need to reduce our carbon emissions radically. We need uh, more insulation on our houses, so we don't need to use so much, um, uh, so much heating. We do have to have smaller houses, which are easier to keep warm. We, so we have to have sensible architecture. Or in very hot regions of the world, we need to um, do things like uh, um, build the houses in such a way that it's going to lose heat, not retain it. Fairly large rooms, fairly high ceilings, and uh, natural ventilation as much as possible. Not saying no AC, just less AC. Dressing sensibly, like in Australia when it's very hot, it's completely acceptable in a business environment to wear a smart pair of shorts and a smart short-sleeved shirt, no tie. Uh, and that's that, just dress for the climate, and everybody does it. If you're in a, if you're in a fairly hot place, um, don't dress as though you're in a cold climate, having to wear a proper suit. 
So we're going to have um, fewer cars. The cars we have have to get smaller, more fuel efficient, more electric vehicles, less travel, more use of public transport. There are all sorts of things that we can do. And instead of building um, many houses for the super wealthy, we're just going to have to provide decent housing for those who need it and, and reduce our carbon footprint. So uh, it would take a great deal of courage to face up to this and say that we're going to have to be uh, less wasteful. And of course, the wealthier nations use far more per head than the uh, needier nations. So uh, the science is out there. It's, it's proved almost certainly. And some of the deniers, they're obviously they're funded by big oil because there's a scintilla of doubt. They'll say it's not happening, which, it, which is nonsense. The other thing is, supposing I was wrong. Supposing it isn't happening, or indeed it's not caused by human activity, then we would, there would still be these gains from moving away from carbon, from hydrocarbon fuels. We would still have a cleaner environment. We still have less uh, pollutants out there. We still wouldn't have oil slicks. We still wouldn't have explosions of fires caused, caused by oil, gas, and coal. Um, we still wouldn't have some of the noxious chemicals which are emitted by, uh, by burning coal. Um, we'd still have a quieter cleaner, more pleasant planet in all sorts of ways. So for the reasons I've outlined, I beg to propose. Now, I am the, the opposition, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the House. Uh, I oppose this motion for a number of reasons. First of all, it's an unproven assertion and we shouldn't change our whole lifestyle on, on the basis of uh, such uh, claims. It's um, not quite evidenceless, but this proposition, it's um, very tenuous. There are major doubts about it. There are studies which prove otherwise. So I think this idea of climate change as being caused by uh, human behavior is possibly rooted in, in superstition. There's this desire for self-loathing amongst many people. There's this asceticism. So you see this neo-puritanism on the other side. Uh, it's often funded by leftists um, because they desire more state control. They just want to boss us around. They're petty tyrants, or indeed they wish to redistribute wealth, or they hate the uh, more affluent countries, particularly the United States. That's what green energy is really about. Um, so then th green energy is also a business. So there's some vested interest and profits for that. And look at turbines. Wind turbines are hugely expensive, subsidized by the state, kill many birds. Um, and they generate just a fraction of the energy that's actually needed. In the United Kingdom, a fairly windy country, because it's by the Atlantic, wind turbines generate only 1% of the energy needed by the country. So we cannot disinvent the car. We cannot disinvent the internal combustion engine. That would be to keep people in poverty. The car is the most magnificent invention, as it's lifted um, hundreds of millions of people out of, out of poverty just in a few decades. And it applies to buses as well. And all right, sometimes people are using public transport is more efficient, certainly on road space. But, you know, a car is like a metaphor for a free society. I decide when I leave, which route I take, how fast I go within the speed limit, uh, what music is played, if any, who's in the car with me, what the smell is like in the car, if I'm going to use some sort of air freshener, or I don't want a malodorous person there or someone eating food I don't like the smell of, things like that. I decide when I stop and I go exactly door to door. So it's fantastic. Now, I know that we can get caught in traffic jams, and that's why it's good to have public transport takes the pressure off the road. But um, we're not going to move away from the internal combustion engine. We could be, make things more fuel efficient, but most people want to do that anyway because it's cheaper, because they can't afford to run these large cars. But, um, you know, you're taking away cars from, from wealthy people. The, the Sorry, ordinary car people would not be allowed to afford big cars, be able to afford big cars through the scheme proposed. If big cars are such a terrible thing, you could just simply ban them instead of letting taxation or the price mechanism deter most people from buying large cars. It's, it's wrong to say, oh yeah, the rich are allowed to buy them, but when we're, the poor are not. No, if they really are immoral, have a law against them. Cars above a certain weight or not so fuel efficient. And planes, what are you going to do about that? Um, I know we're moving to electric planes. I'm not sure it's quite practical. Um, and that might make things more fuel efficient. We're not against fuel efficiency, by the way. Um, it just saves money, and obviously the fuel will run out one day, centuries from now. But um, the idea that, he, that it's poisoning us is nonsense. There's sometimes when the temperature's gone down year on year, and uh, we shouldn't be terribly concerned about uh, sea levels uh, rising slightly. They used to be much higher, sometimes they were much lower. Um, we, could, we could, even if we thought sea levels really weren't rising, we could build huge sea defenses, sea walls, and so on. Most of the Netherlands is below sea level. 
So uh, the other side are those who are desperate to keep most people in penury. And we say that pauperism ought to be abolished, not preserved. So we have many other existential threats to homo sapiens. Uh, nuclear weapons could wipe out the planet in 10 minutes. We have uh, various uh, communicable diseases, AIDS, for example. They're increasingly, they're a drug-resistant uh, um, versions of tuberculosis. Antibiotics are working less and less effectually because uh, diseases are forming a resistance to, to them. There's starvation in some parts of the planet. There's Ebola. So we face many, many grave threats. And yet the, the other side of the house are concentrating on something which um, is just not real. And even if it is harming us, it's going to take decades before it has a significant effect. I've been hearing this all my life, and it's just turned out to be the boy who cried wolf. So there's their scaremongering. Climate change, change happens anyway, before humans even existed. There, there, was, there was a mini ice age around the 17th century. You might have heard of frost fairs in London. The River Thames froze solid. People probably go on there for a month. The grapes were grown in southern England in the Middle Ages, you know, in the wild, not in greenhouses. There was no English Channel. If you go back centuries ago, people could walk from, from uh, what's now Great Britain to France or, you know, between Alaska and uh, Siberia, there was, the, there was the land bridge. So um, climate change is a natural event and is not occasioned by uh, human activity. So I would like the other side to stop myth uh, making and stop trying to frighten people into following their highly contentious policies. If you want to make a case for uh, impoverishing us, for being a Luddite and, and taking away our technology, depriving people of the conveniences of life, all right, do it. But don't do so on the basis of this spurious science. Um, it's um, absolute uh, nonsense. It's ideologically driven and politically motivated furphy that they are uh, advocating for on the other side. I beg to oppose.